oils treat you like you treat them. So if you treat them with care, they'll take care of you. And if you fry them, they will fry your health. Welcome to the Food Matters Podcast, your home for health and wellness. My name is James Colhoun, filmmaker and founder of foodmatters.com, and I am your host on this journey to inner and outer transformation. Before we dive into today's episode, I want to take a short moment to talk to you about the Food Matters Nutrition Certification Program, because studying nutrition completely changed my life. It helped me to heal my father get him off six different medications, lose 50 pounds and completely regain and transform his life and health. But the problem is, is that we're not really taught about nutrition in our schooling system. The medical profession is rarely pronouncing the facts of using nutrition as medicine. And we have a fast food industry that thrives off misleading consumers. So if you're looking to learn about how to use nutrition as medicine to either heal yourself or a loved one or help prevent chronic disease, or you wanna take that next step on your study and nutrition journey and become a certified nutrition coach, then the Food Matters Nutrition Certification Program is for you. This is a 10 week or self-paced, internationally accredited certification program designed to take you through some of the most important topics on the la- and the latest research when it comes to nutrition and natural healing, including gut healing, autoimmune conditions, balancing hormones naturally, detoxification, biochemical individual approaches to nutrition, plus it brings together the best that we know about uh, nutrition science and anthropological research and bringing these two approaches together to help you cut through the confusion about what to eat and what to avoid for optimum health. To find out more about the nutrition certification program, plus to download your curriculum guide, head to foodmatters.com forward slash study. You can pause this right now. It will only take you 30 seconds. That's foodmatters.com forward slash study, or you can head to the show notes for more information. Have a beautiful day. Hello, everybody. Uh, My guest today is someone special, and I'm very excited to be speaking to them because of a few different things. First of all, their work in popularizing good fat uh, for the world at a time when we were emerging from a war on fat in the 70s and 80s and even early 90s and uh also uh, a book that he wrote had an enormous impact on myself and laurentine at the time when we were studying nutrition that's called fats that heal and fats that kill um udo erasmus is my guest today you've probably seen his products all around the world as well udo's oils uh he's a supplement brand and he is an expert when it comes to understanding the power of fats that can help us heal and also understanding the power of fats that can kill us in a way. Uh, Udo, hello, welcome, great to have you here. Hi, glad to be on. I, uh, it's an honor to be on here. Fantastic, well, it's equally reciprocated. Um, Can you start off telling us a little about your work? I mean, you are one of the pioneers in my mind uh, when it comes to the healthy fat movement. Um, I don't know anybody that was as loud or as prominent as you in the early days when I was starting to study nutrition. Um, You know, there was a few fringe people talking about coconut oil, uh, I think Bruce Fife and a few others, but your name is for me at the top of the hill when it comes to good fat. And uh, how did you come into this work? And it must have been difficult yeah. because there was a lot of people saying that fat was bad at the time. I'd love to hear about how you came to this and and, and the beginnings of your research. Yeah, well, um, well, I came out of the Second World War. So we were refugees when I was two and a half years old. And so it was very chaotic in my early childhood. So I never took anybody's word for anything. My parents told us, question everything. So I pretty much have lived my life that way. And and I was always driven to try to experience things to find out, as opposed to just reading. I did a lot of reading because it was safe. You know, I didn't feel safe as a kid, so I did a lot of reading. But I always took it with a grain of salt. Everything you read, you know, is somebody's opinion. You don't know what their foundation is. And so you have to take that into account when you do the reading. 
So I got into science because I wanted to understand how the world works, because I wanted to understand how people could live in harmony because I came out of a war. Mm. And I thought when I was six years old, I'm gonna f that's what I'm going to find out. I'm going to find out how people can live in harmony because it, what I came through is not the way we should live. So science, to understand how things work, it makes the world predictable. And then I got into biosciences because creatures are fascinating. And then I got into psychology to figure out how thinking works, because if you want to live in harmony, thinking seems to always get in the way. <laughs> then I took a year of medicine because I wanted to know what health is, but I found out it's only about disease and I left. and went back into biological sciences, biochemistry, genetics, because in biology, you learn how normal creatures work in normal situations. And that would, could be called the study of health, but nobody called it that. And so I got into that, and then there was still something missing in my life, and I left. And I went a little bit of psychedelic in the 60s. I'm 80, so you can figure it out <laughs> how old I was during the various parts of it. And, uh, and then I started doing a practice because my heart ached all the time. And I didn't know why. started when I was 17, and I didn't figure it out until I was 30. And I had some really powerful experiences. And then I got married, and we had three kids, and my marriage broke up, and I was really upset. So I took a job as a pesticide sprayer, full-time job. And I was really careless because I wanted to kill something, and pesticides are made for killing things, right? So a perfect job for me in my state of emotional state. And after three years of being really careless, I got poisoned by the pesticides I sprayed. Uh, that's predictable outcome there. <laughs> and, uh, and then I went to the doctor and said, uh, what do you have for pesticide poisoning? And she said, nothing. And that day, the penny really dropped for me on what it means that health is my responsibility. I, I already knew it. You know, I heard it. Is the health is usually, yeah, well, that makes sense. But now it really made sense. And because I had the background, I went into the journals in Medline. You had 600,000, 600, sorry, 16 million studies in Medline at the time. And about 300,000 of them were on nutrition. And about 30,000 were on fats. And about 6,000 were on omega-6s mostly, because omega-3s were not even known to be essential in 1980. That didn't happen until 1981. And I started looking for, well, if your body's made out of food, and something goes wrong, then all you have to do is raise the standard because your body turns over 98% every year. So if you raise your standard of food intake, should be really food, or food water, air, uh, you, if you raise the standard, then in one year, you will have rebuilt you 98% of your body to a higher standard. That's called healing. That's why healing is possible, because you're, you're a construction site. You're always under construction, right? If you want to wreck yourself, then lower your standards. And in, 98, in, in, in one year, you can have rebuilt your body 98% to a lower standard, right? Mm -hmm. So I started looking at that, and then I, got, I looked at everything, anything to do with health and nutrition, disease and nutrition, because focus, my focus was on food at that time. And I got stuck in fats. Because that was so confusing. It was the most confusing area. Like, and I'll give you the, the one that really got to me. Omega-6 is an essential nutrient. It says the study. What does it mean, essential nutrient? Well, you have to bring it in from outside because you can't make it in your body from anything else. But you have to have it to live and be healthy. If you don't get enough, your health deteriorates. You get deficiency symptoms. They are degenerative in nature. They get worse with time. And if you don't get enough long enough, you die. This is like super important building blocks for body construction. And, and the third part of the definition was that if you're going down because you're not getting enough, but you then bring enough back into your diet before you die, because death by definition is not reversible, then all of your problems that come from not getting enough are reversed because life knows what to do provided we take responsibility here at mouth intake to make sure that all of the essential building blocks land in the body in the quantities that are necessary for life to make a body that works. And you want optimum, if you want optimum health, and, and you, you know, if you're okay with minimum health, well, then you don't need as much, right? And, uh, 
And uh, there are 42 essential nutrients, 18 minerals, 13 vitamins, nine essential amino acids, two essential fatty acids. And so, and then the year, while I was going looking at the research, the year after I got poisoned and I was steeped in the research. Oh, well, no. So let me, let me finish the omega-6 story. So that was one study. And then the next study I read, it says omega-6s give you cancer and kill you. And I went, what? It's essential for health. And then it gives you cancer and kills you. It's like, it doesn't compute. That doesn't make any sense. And it was that contradiction that forced me to look deeper and look at how oils are made. And then I realized oils are made by being treated with harsh chemicals, uh, non-organic seeds. So they have pesticides in them. I didn't know that at the time. Mm. But they're made by being treated with Drano. Then, uh, sorry, not Drano. A corrosive base called sodium hydroxide. Then they're treated with a very corrosive acid called phosphoric acid. Then they're treated with bleaching clays. And then they have to they, they, they go rancid and have to be heated to frying temperature to blow off, to boil off the rancid molecules because they stink. They, t- they smell bad and they taste bad. And all of this is done so that you have an oil that has a two to three year shelf life. And when you do that, you can do a mass production and make the oil in Vancouver, where I live, and sell it in Johannesburg and in Tokyo and in New York and in Buenos Aires. And the idea is, oh, my God, big market, global market. But in order to do that, you have to have a good shelf life. And the problem with the essential fatty acids, and I'll get to the omega-3 in a second, is that they're the most sensitive of all of our nutrients, all of our essential nutrients. They're damaged by light, by oxygen, and by heat. So they have to be protected from those. And, of course, if you don't want to refrigerate the oil and you don't want to put it in opaque containers and you don't want to put a box around them and you just like, like want to like have them sit around, then they're going to spoil really rapidly. So you get a short shelf life. So by nature, they have a short shelf life. Unless they're in nature's packaging, which is pretty good. Nature's packaging is quite effective. And so the idea, so that was the idea. And I said, well, I can't get healthy on oils like this. We should make them with health in mind. And I said, well, what does it take? Well, you have to make a really tight system so that no light, oxygen, or heat gets to the oil from the time it's closed in the seed through the pressing, the filtering, the settling, the filling, till in this brown glass bottle, in a box, in the fridge, in the factory, And then if you want to ship it, we figured out maybe two weeks without refrigeration is okay. More than that, if we ship it further than that, like when we ship it from North America to Europe or to Asia, uh, then we actually ship it refrigerated. Mm -hmm. So we figured all that out and put that together. And the year after I got poisoned, it was established, that was 1981, it was established that omega-3 is also an essential nutrient not just omega-6. And it turns out that omega-3s, there are fewer sources. It is five times more sensitive to damage done by light, oxygen, and heat than omega-6. And 99% of the population does not get enough omega-3s for optimum health, and every cell requires them. And at that point, uh, you know, I had a I went off like a firecracker. It was like, oh my God, if we could make them with health in mind, which was what I was already thinking about, and we could pre- bring the missing omega-3s back, we could help almost everybody, right? This is the single yeah. most widespread essential nutrient deficiency of our time. Worse than vitamin D, worse than magnesium, worse than B6. So, and so, and then, you know, I, it's like, oh my God, I found a purpose. Oh my God, oh my God. It was like, and the enthusiasm that that generated, because if something feels really good about helping Mm -hmm. people or helping creatures have a better quality of life that just feels right. And that was that enthusiasm is, was the driver behind the program. Wow. So that's, that's kind of how I, how I got there. And then we learned along the way, all of the things and we tried things and we experimented and, you know, 
at the beginning, we put it in plastics. Then I found a plastic swells when you put oil in it and then ingredients from the plastics will drift into the oil. So I said, no, I think we, we need to use glass. And the people I worked with didn't want to do that. You know, I mean, there was all kinds of, and then we set standards for the people, everybody, you know, because we created a buzz because we were on fire. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's the only way I can describe it. We were on fire. We created this buzz. And it's not like we set out to create a buzz. It's just like we were just like, I mean, I was on, we, I, it was just, oh my God, oh my God, I get, oh my God, this is incredible. I get to do this, right? <laughs> and uh, so we, we if Pete, and then everybody wanted to, to distribute the oil. So we would say, well, okay, do you have refrigeration in your storage facility? Mm-hmm. If they said yes, I would hand them over to the deals maker that I, who was my driver also, right? We did a, a, a uh, we did a, a 101 day tour in a van without care, air conditioning in the hottest months, July, August, half of June, half of September in the US. Uh, went to 85 cities in 35 states, did 17,000 miles by road, <laughs> worked all day, drove all night, did it all on raw vegetables on, uh, because it took us, we found out if we ate carbs, we fell asleep, and if we ate meat, we felt heavy. So we did the whole thing on raw vegetables. That was my first pass at a plant-based raw, raw diet. Yeah. And we had energy to burn. Mm. And so created the buzz. So they say, do you have refrigeration in your factory, in your, in your storage facility? If they said yes, I'd hand them over to the driver to do the deal, if they could do a deal. And if they said no, I said, are you willing to bring it in? And if they said yes, I would say, call us when you got it. And if they said no, I would say this is a good time to end the interview because we mm-hmm. we set standards and we were not budging from the standards because mm-hmm. we wanted to make something that actually works, that retains its health benefits, that actually would help people get healthier. And mm-hmm. it was like, I mean, in a way, I'm still on fire. This is like <laughs> an incredible, beautiful, divinely inspired by personally made uh, disaster. <laughs> right. Yeah. And uh, and uh, it, I. I I just still think I just think it's like God. I really I get get to do this. This is amazing. It's so, so beautiful. That's 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 the short long story. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm I'm so grateful to hear that story because knowing your book and your work, and then seeing your face on all these boxes in all of these fridges around the world, uh, to to know how it was uh, brought about is is really beautiful. And I I want to get to more details on on the essential oils further on in the conversation but one thing you touched on was the manufacturing process of seed oils now one of the big things that has become more and more prominent in the health space um in particular probably more in the i would say less in the vegan vegetarian space but more in the carnivore ancestral space and i i'm i'm a middle path sort of person i believe that there's different for everybody at different stages of life, biochemical individuality. And on more of that carnivore paleo ancestral side, there is a big movement towards an um, anti-seed oil movement, in particular, the canola, the the, the vegetable oils that we see. And and the way that you just described their production process to me really hit home as to how dangerous those oils are. So you, you talked to, yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So you're you know, there's harsh chemicals in the extraction. Then there is like some sort of clays that are used and then they heat it up to burn off the rancidity so that it's shelf stable, all of these things. And then these types of vegetable oils, uh, p- p- sunflower, safflower, canola, um, soy oil have made their way into a plethora of processed foods in the modern diet, um, can we speak to how dangerous these oils are for our health, um, and and what makes them so dangerous? Yes, yes. Let me talk about two things. One is the issue is no oils, whole foods. A lot of people saying that. I, I know I deal yes. with it every day, right? Yeah, yeah. So, <clears throat> and the, and the idea is well, nature's nature nature made whole foods, and nature's mandate is optimum health. I don't know if that's true because nature's mandate 
is that you should be healthy enough to get born, healthy enough to grow up, and, and healthy enough to have your kids and be around long enough until they're grown up. And when they're grown up, nature doesn't need you anymore. And mm-hmm. then it's recycling time. So how do you make it happen that way is, well, you never have optimum health. You have adequate health, minimum health, but not necessarily optimum health. And because, because people were saying that, I decided to put it to the test. So what I did is I ate flax and sunflower seeds, flax for omega-3, sunflower seeds for omega-6s. I can take about five tablespoons of flax seed and about three of sunflower seed, uh, two, sorry, two of sunflower seed, and flax swells to six times its volume when you eat it because of the mucilage fiber it contains. So I couldn't eat more than that. And even in summer when I need less oil than in winter, in California, my, I could not keep my skin soft and velvety. My skin would actually get drier. So I can't do it on seeds alone to optimize my skin. Now, why skin? Because skin gets it last and loses it first. That's nature having priorities, because if your heart dried out before your skin did, you'd have beautiful skin and your heart wouldn't work. So nature gives heart priority and the liver priority and the kidneys priority. You can live with dry skin, so you can get away with that. So skin gets gets them last and loses them first. And you need them sure. both. They form a barrier in the skin against the loss of moisture. So that, that's how we measured optimum. Everybody can do it because everybody's got skin. And a ballpark a tablespoon per 50 pounds of body weight per day, mixed in food, intake spread out over the course of the day, because oils were always with foods. You belong with food. It's not, not a problem. And whatever it takes to make your skin soft and velvet. It might be a little more than that. might be a little less than that. Different maybe for different people. I couldn't do it on seeds alone. So I say, okay, you want to do the seeds? Do the seeds. But if your skin is still dry, and you'll notice that more in the desert than in humid climate, and you'll mo- notice it more in winter than in summer, because you burn quite a bit of oil for, for keeping warm in winter, right? In mm. places where there are winters, right? <laughs> then, then if you can't get your skin uh, to, be, to be nice, then take more oil on top of that. So that's, mm. that's what I recommend. I'm not saying everybody should just take oil and just forget about that. No, seeds and nuts are good foods. They're whole foods. But mm-hmm. will you get optimum health? Well, maybe you will. You, you have to try it out for yourself. I know that mm-hmm. I won't. And so I use the oil. I use it with lots of whole foods. So that's the way I deal with the whole food issue. Nice. And the oil in, in increases your fire. You know, if you mm-hmm. want energy, omega-3s are the f- they're fat-burning fire starter, and they give you energy. We did studies with athletes, 40 to 60% increase in their performance of their sport to exhaustion within 30 days of starting to take the oil blend. You also need to balance the omega-3 and 6. So we didn't use flax oil. We used a blend mm-hmm. because flax oil has too much omega-3 mm-hmm. for the omega- amount of omega-6 it has. And you can become omega-6 deficient. I tried that out on myself as well, right? Mm-hmm. So that's the one story. The other story was about the damage, which is where you want it to go. Mm-hmm. So I figured out, uh, or I, I read in the journals, way, way back at the beginning, when an oil is made the way I described, with the harsh chemicals and the overheating, deodorization, the process is called, it's, that's done at frying temperature. So those oils are fried before you even mm-hmm. buy them in the bottle, before you even go in the bottle when you buy them. So they're already fried. And we'll get to frying a little more later too. So when you treat them that way, about a half to 1% of the molecules are damaged. And they turn from something present in nature to something that wasn't necessarily present in nature. And because of that, life never made a genetic program to make the enzymes that you would need to break it down. So they then accumulate in your body and wherever they go, they interfere with, with uh, uh, molecular interactions and they derail the processes that lead to physical health, right? Mm-hmm. So it's like the monkey wrench into the works, right? So I, then I thought, okay, well, 
I wonder why they do that. So I called the Oil Chemist Society, that's the umbrella organization for the oil industry, and said, I want to talk to a researcher. So they put him on the line. And I said, well, when you know that this does damage to the oils, why do you do that? <laughs> you know, why are you okay with damaging the oil? You know, I'm, I was yeah. naive, I guess. So he said, well, one reason we do that is because we can get rid of half the pesticides in the oil. And, you know, I mean, in my head, I had an explosion, <laughs> you know, oh my, you know, because my thought was, oh my God, the other half, the other half of the pesticides stays in the oil and I'd been poisoned yeah. by pesticides. So that was a trigger for me. So I asked him, well, why don't you start with organically grown seeds? And there was this long silence at the other the end of the phone. And I waited. I, I, I can talk, but I can listen to <laughs> I waited. When he got back, he was mad. He said, I don't know what your problem is. The oil is 99% good, and it's only 1% bad. And if you got 99% on an exam, you'd be damn happy, wouldn't you? <laughs> exactly what he said. So now I'm backing off. I say, well, maybe, maybe I'm overreacting. It's only 1%. So we were told as in, in uh, university, when in doubt, do the math. So I did the math. So the question was, if you have a tablespoon of an oil that is 1% damaged by the processing, how many damaged molecules would be in that tablespoon? Give me a guess, James. Um, a point two of a milli milliliter. No, okay, two point two milliliters. Well, out of course, 14, in, 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 a, in a tablespoon. Uh, no, no. In a tablespoon, there's like fifteen 14 milliliters, milliliters right? in a tablespoon. Okay, fourteen. Yeah. Okay, so then you know, one percent of fourteen is point one four. Of a point, milliliter. Uh, 0.14. Yeah, yeah, but how many molecules would that be? Oh, phew, I don't know. I mean, how many molecules in 0 0.14 of a milliliter? The other side. I know. And we and because people don't know, this is this is why I asked the question, yeah. because there's a point to it, right? Sure. So everybody I ask is always makes an estimate that is at least a billion times lower when the actual number is. So the mm. actual number is 60 quintillion molecules in one Whoa. tablespoon of oil that is 1% damage, 60 quintillion. That's more than a million damaged molecules for every one of your body's 60 trillion cells. That's like, and that's in one tablespoon. And intake, people's mm. intake is maybe two to four. And then you use that oil for frying. You multiply another six, three to six yeah. times for the damage done by frying. So now yes. you're talking... Now, so you're talking about an enormous amount of damaged molecules that are you putting in your body, and you're underestimating how damaged, how much you're putting in by a billion times. So then I asked mm. the question, well, if you got on a plane and you were flying home, and somebody who always told the truth told you that your chance of crashing and dying was a billion times higher than you thought it was, based on the information you have, would you get on the airplane? You know, I was in yes. Ireland. I told them I would canoe back to Canada, you know? <laughs> and so the, the point, the, the reason why I make the point is because if we're underestimating, underestimating by a billion times the damage we're doing to ourselves, is that enough to give us pause and say, gee, maybe we should, maybe we should find a way to get our oils made with health in mind? Or, gee, Maybe we shouldn't be using oils for frying, or gee, maybe we shouldn't be using those kind of oils because we're trying to be healthy. And we do this day after day after day after five, 10, 20, 30 years. Somebody gets cancer and say, I don't know why, I don't know what happened. I always ate good, right? Yeah. And because we didn't know that we're underestimating the damage we're doing to ourselves by using damaged oils is a billion times too low, our estimate. And there's also, I mean, the, the way that these damaged process oils have proliferated the modern foodscape as well, from bars to drinks to salad dressings to a, a fried foods. I mean, the, everywhere, ubiquitous. Yeah, oils are, yeah, oils are important, so they, and they're everywhere. And I've, I've traveled like 40 countries, Asia, Africa, uh, North America haven't been to South America, Australia, everybody loves to fry their food. 
yeah. the damage we're done doing to ourselves. And yet what happens when you fry, when you overheat the oils, but also when you overheat the starches and you overheat the proteins by when you fry them, each one independent of the others turns into molecules that increase inflammation and increase the risk of cancer. So anything yeah. you fry will take you in the direction of inflammation and cancer. I had arthritis, beginnings of arthritis in my knees when I was 38. I don't fry anymore. I don't eat fried foods anymore. I'm 80. I turned mm. 80 this year and I have no pain anywhere in my body except when I work out too hard or bang into stump something. But no, no degenerative problems in any part of my body. Just from making mm. and the biggest change I made, I also went more plant based than, than I was as a kid. But the biggest change I made is I threw out my frying pan. I tell people, get your frying pan, turn it upside down, hit yourself on the head with it really hard so it's associated with pain and dump it because you're going to kill okay. yourself well, with that frying pan. Okay, there's, there's a lot of really interesting things coming up here. Um, and I, yeah, uh, good. I, I love this. <laughs> this conversation. So I want to tell you a quick story and I'd love your thoughts on this. So in the yeah. year, in the many years that you've sort of promulgated this data and this information about healthy fats and damaged fats, mm -hmm. there has been more and more people and researchers that have told me that certain fats, like you, like you've explained the 1% of these fats that are damaged accumulate in the body because it cannot be broken down. And in particular, yeah, or it's slow. It's it's the body gets rid of it very slowly. So if you bring it in faster than your body can get rid of it, it'll pile up. It'll accumulate. And I, in particular, I've been told, and and I, I and it's been by quite well researched individuals, like one professor, mm -hmm. a medical doctor, that the sun normally strikes our skin, and with healthy oils in our skin, it's okay. But with damaged oil in our skin it can cause a rancidity and potentially lead to things like sun cancer. So I was visiting a uh, skin check clinic the other day because I live in between Australia and in the Pacific Vanuatu, and then I'm in tropics in Bali often. So I'm, and I'm a Caucasian individual like yourself and I'm exposed to sunlight and I just get my skin checked every now and then. And I brought it up mm -hmm. with this doctor who's a prominent skin check doctor. And I said, what's your take on oils and you know if we're eating too much fried food or damaged fats and can that potentially increase the risk of a, a, a malignant melanoma or something happening in the skin and he's like look I, I don't know I don't think so just put on your sunscreen and stay out of the sun and I'm like okay and I left that that meeting but really to me it feels like if there is a correlation. Where do you sit on this spectrum of damaged fats in particular in relation to skin cancer, but then mm -hmm. also you're saying there's a relationship to all other types of cancer. What's your take on this? Well, so I've seen, I've seen recently people talk about, uh, oh, you shouldn't, you shouldn't use oils, polyunsaturated oils, rich in omega-3 and 6. Uh, you should use saturated fats because they're more stable. That's that part is true, and it's and they say because you can burn your skin and you can cause skin problems. Uh, if the oil is damaged, and most of the research on oils is done on these damaged oils, but they never tell you that the oil is damaged, and they never blame the yeah. damage for the problems. They blame the oil. Mm -hmm. That's why it went to the top of the food pyramid as the thing you should eat least, and the carbs got put on uh. the bottom as the thing you should eat most right? That came out of that research. And when people tell you, uh, you got to remember that most of them that are reading the research, that includes all the guys who don't want to use any oils, including, you know, the famous names in the, in the Whole Foods only, you know, they're reading all the research done on damaged oils. And so they're blaming yeah. all oils for being bad and don't want to use any oils. So I did that experiment too. When I I found out that when I take enough oil to get my skin soft and velvety, I actually tan better and I measured how long it takes me to burn and it's four times longer I can stay in the sun before I burn. 
Whoa. And you, uh, I can still burn. I can still burn. It just, the oil protects my skin from sunburn four times longer than if I don't have the oil. Okay? Mm. Yes. That actually starts to make sense. Now, um, yeah. the other issue is, you know, you're, the sun has burning rays in it. So you got to pay attention anyway. If your skin is black, you have some protection because you came from a place in the tropics where there was too much sun. And so this pigment protected you, but that also kept you from making vitamin D as easily. If your skin is only like Hispanic color, then you get some protection, so you make less vitamin D. And the white guys make vitamin D with sunlight because we came from northerner places, right? And we didn't get as much sun, so we needed to be able to make it more efficiently. And so that the research says that uh, dark-skinned people, like black-skinned people, about 82% are vitamin D deficient. Hispanic people, 75 white people, 68. That's because of the mm. pigment in the skin, right? And we need the sunshine to make, to, they make the vitamin D. So don't, stay out of the sun is your, a recipe for vitamin D deficiency. Or stay yeah. indoors or wear clothes up to your neck. That's a recipe yeah. for vitamin D deficiency. And vitamin D isn't just for bones and teeth. Vitamin D is for heart for lungs, for immune system, uh, you know, it, it, it has so many functions. And we're still, most people are still talking about 400 to 800 units of vitamin D. I take 8,000 a day. You can take 10,000 a day. That'll be optimum for adults around there. And you can do that chronically. But you can overdose if you take 50,000 every day for chronically, right? But sure. the thing is, you should be in the sun. If you're white, you should still be in the sun, you know, because that's your natural source of vitamin D. And you should be running around naked in summer in the sun. Yes. Right? Because yes. just putting a, little, putting a little sun on your face will, will tan your face and make a little vi uh, vitamin D in your head. But actually, <laughs> you know, we weren't, nature didn't create us with, with clothes on, right? No. So... Uh, right. So, so yeah, so, so again, the issue is always fats that heal and fats that kill. If you use the fats that heal, you get protection from the sun to some extent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when you eat fats that kill, they hurt your skin when, when you get sun. Yeah. And yeah. you'll see, I mean, it'll come out in the research sooner or later. It'll come out. It makes a difference. It hasn't a lot yeah. of research been done on good oils because we're not a, we're not a, a ma massive company and you know we've done a couple of studies but uh, we can't do everything are you suffering from gut issues an autoimmune condition chronic pain imbalanced hormones and you just can't seem to find a solution well you're not alone if you're listening to this podcast you likely value your health your well-being, energy, and vitality. And at Food Matters, we believe that your body is worthy of good care and that there's nobody more suitably qualified to care for it than yourself, which is why we have created the Food Matters Nutrition Certification Program. This program is designed to improve and increase your knowledge when it comes to important topics around the gut, autoimmune conditions, balancing hormones, detoxification. Plus, it really has helped me cut through the confusion about what to eat and avoid when there's so many different dietary philosophies out there from veganism to paleo to plant-based to whole foods to wild foods to qualitarian, who knows these days. We have assembled some of the brightest minds in nutrition and natural healing including experts like David Wolf, Dr. Livy Weaver, Mark Hyman, Dr. Alejandro Junger, and so many more. To find out more about how you can join us on this program and become a certified nutrition coach to help heal yourself, loved ones, or even help take this message to more people by working with people one-on-one -on -one or starting your own wellness business, you can find out more at foodmatters.com forward slash study. Again, that's foodmatters.com forward slash study also because the entire population is filled with predominantly toxic oils. So you do a study 
in a population and you're starting from a toxic base. And, and so what is interesting about that is that I reflect back on in the 90s and 2000s, there were campaigns in Australia um, to stop skin cancer and it was slip, slop, slap. So slip, slip on a, a hat, slop on some sunscreen, slip, slop, slap on some suns, what, whatever, cover up basically, and then cover up with this sunscreen. And, and it's perpetuating this fear of the sun. It's perpetuating people eat whatever you like. So the, one of the national foods in Australia being an ex-British colony is fish and chips, which is basically deep fried potatoes and deep fried fish in a batter made with like modern domesticated semi-dwarf uh, semi high glutinous wheat, right? And then it's deep fried in, in an unstable vegetable oil, which we eat. And then where these toxic um, fat loaded system exposed to a harsh sunlight in an environment that's suited to, you know, more indigenous Aboriginal people. You look at the Aboriginal people of Australia, they are not white. It's a recipe for disaster. So we have this this increase in skin cancer and increase in all types of cancer. So this to me is just such a profound connection. And we're never really going to see data with healthy people, with healthy oil, with healthy sun exposure, because that, that subset doesn't really exist in the population. Not yet. Not yet. But the thing is, but, but to, just to be really clear, you do need to pay attention how much time you spend in the sun. I'm just telling you that I can spend four times more time in the sun than I used to be able to before I burn. But I'll still burn yeah. if I exceed that because I, I, I did that too. Yes. <laughs> right? Yeah, of course. And I mean, burning is not good for phytoaging. Burning is not good for right. increasing your risk of, of skin cancer. So of course, we want to control that early morning, yeah. late afternoon is better because yeah. there's more filtration, more infrared through, through, the, through the atmosphere. Yeah. Yeah. Also, some interesting things I've been learning is that increasing vitamin C content. Um, also, uh, doc, uh, Professor Ian Brighthope was talking about if you burn or to prevent yourself from burning, taking more, um, uh, taking more things like spirulina or uh, astaxanthin, things that can reduce the the, the burning right. um, antioxidants in the skin, and also yeah. antioxidants and also good quality fats, and then also some sort of renegades talking about not using sunglasses. So allowing more full spectrum light into the pineal gland, which tells the body that there is strong sun and it appropriately adjusts as opposed to wearing mm -hmm. dark glasses, which I would often right. do and I would burn more frequently. Mm -hmm. So I'm personally experimenting with not using sunglasses as often. Um, yeah, I don't use sunglasses. I don't like them. You know, I'd rather squint than wear sunglasses. And it's part of it is too, is like, I like nature. You know, we come out of nature. We are part of nature. Nature created us, you know, and I, I, like, my, I like my connection to nature a lot. Nice. I like it. Yeah. Me too. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about, uh, well, actually, before we move on from damaged fats, I want to talk about it because people... Not everyone's going to take, uh, we'll get to the omega threes and the sixes and the nines and, at the end here, but just talk about these fats mm -hmm. and frying and damaged fats. So people love fried food. People love cooked yep. food, you know, and people, not everybody listening to this is going to take their fry pan and bang, the, bang their head with it. <laughs> um, so is there a step in between that where people can interact with um, fats in a, in a way to cook with them? or even to deep fry with them? This is a personal question because I every now and then would love to eat fish and chips, but I don't because I feel horrible after it. And I every now and then like to eat pizza once a month or something. Isn't that enough of an answer? I call it gluten You night. feel terrible after it? Gluten night. Yeah, true, of course. But how could I, is there a way that we can, is there an oil we can deep fry with that is, that is the best of a worst bunch? Or is there an oil or a group of oils that we can shallow fry with? So, so talk to me on this. Yeah. I, well, there are two answers. Number one, frying is a health-destroying practice. And oils treat you like you treat them. So if you treat them with care, they'll take care of you. And if you fry them, they will fry your health. 
That's just how it is. Okay. If you're going to fry, then the harder the fat, the less damage you do. See, we, we always pour oils in, they're liquid because they have more sensitive fatty acids in them. So they're burned more than lard would be or butter would be or maybe coconut yes. oil would be. But if you're turning food sure. brown with this practice, you're creating molecules that increase inflammation and increase cancer. That's, yes. that's the law. That's how it is. You know, and I, I call what you just asked the Russian roulette question. It's the, it's the what yeah. can I get away with question, right? And you don't get away with anything. And a better question to ask is, what would I need to do in order to have the longest life and the best health that is possible given my, given my genetic human makeup? That's the, that's the better question to ask. And of course, you, that's what you spend most yeah. of your time doing. So it's not like I have to go through all of that yes. with you. Right? But most people ask that Russian roulette question because they have a habit and they don't want to give up the habit. And you know, and, and you know what? Then if you, if you don't want to give up the habit, then you'll continue getting the statistics that we have in most of our developed countries of cancer and cardio yeah. and diabetes and, and inflammation. So yeah, but there's a spectrum, right? So on the on the end of the spectrum is people deep frying with damaged vegetable oil, which is horrific, right? And cooking and frying with damaged vegetable oils. On the other end is maybe baking or traditional. You know, in the in in Vanuatu, they cook in the ground with food wrapped in banana leaves. You know, with stones on top. There's no oil in there. That's just cooking the food you know and then and then in the middle is like a like you said lard or yeah. coconut oil or butter but as soon as you be brown it or it becomes too brown or burnt you've, you've created a significant amount of damage so i, yeah. I see what I'm, I'm understanding the spectrum now yeah and also when you when you put things in the fire that wrapped in seaweed or whatever it is you're actually not frying it you're you're steaming it because as long as the food is wet you can't heat it above fry. At, you can't heat it to frying temperature. When you bake bread, on the yeah. inside the bread is steamed. On the outside, it's burned because it heats up over over water boiling temperature and to oven temperature, which burns it. But the inside, as long as it, the inside is wet, it is only steamed. So then you could say, well, you know, so fry all your stuff in oil, but then cut all the burnt stuff off because the inside of your meat or whatever you whatever you fried, that's only steamed and it's not damaged. But what you're doing then is wasting your food. So why do, why do it? Why not just put it, why not cook in water? When I was a kid, cooking meant in water and frying, deep frying meant in oil. Now we say when we cook, we usually mean frying. There's a distinction between the two. What we used to do, we cut the steak into cubes, meat into stoops, whatever, cubes, whatever it was. We threw it in the stew with the vegetables and the spices Tasted great, wasn't burnt, didn't make us sick, and didn't shorten our life. And then people say to me, oh, right. yeah, but I love the taste of burnt food. No, you don't. If you scrape that burnt stuff off and put it on a spoon, took a spoonful of that burnt stuff off the food you burnt, it's bitter, it's, it's nice. scratchy, yeah. it's acrid, it squeaks between your teeth like chalk on the blackboard, and it tastes disgusting. But you do it because your mother... Your, your, your mother, your previous generation was bamboozled into using oil for cooking by the industry because they said, oh, my God, they, get, they cook in water and we don't make any money on water. Let's get them to use Whoa. oil for cooking. And that, and that habit spread around the world. Whoa. Wow. Udo, that's so big. So true. We have to remember it, but... The dairy industry used used to hand out milk to school children and not good quality raw milk. They handed out pasteurized, homogenized, non-organic dairy to school children. And, you know, the, the meat and dairy industry were, were prolific in, in, in sort of creating the food pyramid. Can, can we speak to something else now? Um, look at, so in America, it's sort of this perfect 
environment for studying chronic disease, right? Because they're the leaders in the world, you know, in technology, in advancement, and in disease. Let's be honest, right? So, and and I don't want to leave out much of the rest of the Western developed world. Many parts of Western Europe are increasing in chronic disease. Uh, UK, Australia, New Zealand, we're, we're catching up. So there are some really interesting things there. Obviously, increase in the consumption of seed oils. And when we talk seed oils, we're not talking, you know, yours that are in beautiful quality glass that have like... Et- Let's call it consumption of damaged seed oils. Perfect. So increase in the consumption of damaged seed oils. Then one interesting thing, so a, 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 a colleague and a dear friend of mine, uh, John Robbins, wrote a book called Diet for a New America, which was probably a similar era to... to a, good fats, bad fats, fats that heal, fats that kill, sorry. And he correlated uh, animal consumption and chronic disease in the, in the West and also d- dairy consumption. And, and then looking back at that data with a new frame of reference around damaged fats, in particular, what we feed these animals, it became clear, and John's highlighted this too, that when we started industrial farming practices, we started feeding these animals genetically modified, pesticide-ridden corn, wheat, and soy. And these animals, mostly ruminant animals, let's look at a cow, were designed to eat grass. And that grass made them healthy. And then we ate healthy animals. And we put them in stews and we didn't fry them. You know, that's typical European style winter food. Um, now we look we look at what we've done we fed them these these corn wheat and soy the animals get sick we put them on antibiotics then we cut them up and we fatten them up and we cut them up and we eat them in burgers with you know modern wheat and it's fried and we eat them with fried chips right and we're getting and then we have a, a high fructose corn syrup drink and we're all sick right so is it that we increased animal consumption that made us sick or is it that the animals are more sick or they're high the the the, the ratio of omega 6 and omega 9 to omega 3 is out of whack and these are pro inflammatory foods because the animals sick can can you explain that to me yeah it's not an either or we didn't eat as much meat when we were what you call gatherers gardeners hunters we we didn't eat as much meat because there was a time when We only had rocks to hunt with and animals run away and fly away and swim away and, you know, or they attack us. So coming home without meat was pretty common. And when you don't have any meat, then you eat what grows around you that doesn't run away and doesn't fight back, which is called plants. So, so we didn't eat as much meat. That's one issue. How the meat was grown on grass is very different than growing meat on starch like our grain fed beef, right? And cows are not grain eaters. Cows are grass eaters. There's not much, there's not a lot of carbs in grass, except the cellulose, which is their carbs. So what we feed them has changed. We put hormones in it, we pesticides, um, uh, drugs, and then they don't get exercise. And then they're cooped up and then they sit in their own feces is that going to make, and you know, oh, they don't get any herbs. You know, when an animal eats herbs, yeah. those herbs protect it because the, the herbs make uh, substances for their own protection from viruses, funguses, bacteria, sunlight, whatever it is. When we eat that, when the animal eats it, it gets some protection from that. When we eat an animal that eats like that, we get some protection from, from the meat. Well, that's gone. So there's another whole reason why meat isn't meat and you know isn't what meat used to be. Right? So there's lots of issues. I think we eat too much meat. I think the meat's not clean. Uh, I think the animals are are reared badly and fed badly. Uh, obviously uh, there's environmental issues with the with the enormous amount of uh, food animals we grow. So there's environmental issues there as well. And the oil we feed them is damaged so they're also getting damaged oils. Right. Yeah. So so all of it to get and I don't I haven't seen research that separates out how much of the problem of meat eating and longevity or disease comes from each one of those different factors. But they all play a role. Yeah. 
So, so if you're going to eat meat, yeah, you know, the old hunters, when they went out in the woods and, and had meat and they had, didn't have it that often and they didn't have refrigeration, so they couldn't keep it. So they couldn't eat meat every day. They gorged on it. You know, if they got an animal, they, you know, they all ate it pretty quick before it, before it spoiled in a day or two. Right. And then maybe they had long times where they didn't have any meat. Eggs, you know, finding eggs Mm. is a little bit hard too. Right. So. And uh, the cows, uh, the, the the milk deal is is also a, a much more modern invention. Although we got cow milk from a farm that wasn't pasteurized, that would turn sour and turn yeah. into clabbered milk or yogurt, and that milk was guaranteed yeah. better than the milk in the carton. Because I opened a carton one time, like we did with the milk, and we just left it out and it turned sour. I did that with a carton once before I knew better, and the and the milk rotted in the carton. And it stunk and it mm. tasted awful because the probiotics in cow milk, when it's raw, get killed by pasteurization or ultra pasteurization. And then the, the, the rot bacteria fall into, the, into, that, into that sterile milk and then they rot it because that's their job. Yeah. Right. So, they, so everything has changed and processing is always the issue. Yeah. No. I want to address one thing that I saw in the notes that I we haven't got to, which is saturated fats. Mm-hmm. Saturated fats yes, these days have a pretty bad reputation. You eat saturated fats, you get fat. I, I debate it. Most of our overweight comes from eating more carbs than we burn and forcing the body to turn them into fats. And that's worse mm-hmm. for sugar and starch and white flour than it is for whole grains. <clears throat> but it's I can get fat on whole grains. And on fruit, I, I put on weight very easily. So I have to limit those. And I eat tons of greens and I take good oils. And the good oils, omega 3s, turn on fat burning in the body and they turn off fat production. Mm-hmm. So if you lower your carbs and increase your omega 3s, you can actually use those fats for weight management, for fat loss. They also make anti inflammatories. So some people's overweight is inflammation and water retention. Well, they deal with that as well. And then they give you stable energy and you don't get the cravings. You don't get the blood sugar swings. You don't get the mood swings. You don't, the, you don't get the insulin swings, all of which, you know, create, create addiction sometimes. And, they, and insulin, when your insulin goes yeah. up and down, it shortens your life. So, <clears throat> but, <clears throat> but to go back to the saturated fats, a book got written about coconut, where every claim that can be legitimately made for omega-3s on the basis of existing research was made for coconut oil, which has virtually no omega-3 at all, and maybe only 2 to 4, 2 to 6% omega-6. And I actually went Mm. into Medline and looked for the references on coconut oil and all of those claims, and there wasn't a single one that was actually documented. There was not a single claim mm. that was made in that book. And, and that cr- created the coconut craze. Now there's research that yeah. says that coconut oil will actually increase LDL. So you gotta be a little careful. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, and because it became so big, now the researchers are, are onto it and they're looking at it. Mm. Um, satu- but but the, the issue of saturated fats is a, it's, it's fuel. It's basically high energy fuel, nine calories per gram. Yeah. You can store it in your body. You, if, you, if you tried to store carbs in your body, you'd be twice, more than twice as big for the fat. same, you know, for the same yeah. amount of energy storage. So fat is a good way to store, store energy. And fat is also our insulation because we don't have fur. So fat is our fur. Fat under our skin ten, helps us keep warm. And um, uh, but but saturated fat has a bad reputation, in my opinion, for a mistaken reason. And it goes like this: saturated fats increase insulin resistance, and they make platelets more sticky. So that means they take you towards diabetes and towards cardiovascular disease. But omega threes mm-hmm. make your platelets less sticky, and they make you more insulin sensitive. 
So they actually do the opposite of the saturated fats. So if if 99% of the population is omega-3 deficient or doesn't get enough omega-3s, then the saturated fats hurt them because of that. So the problem mm. saturated fats cause should be mostly blamed on not getting enough omega-3s in your diet. And when you optimize your omega-3s, then you can eat the saturated fats and not set yourself up for diabetes and cardiovascular disease. Wow. Wow. So it's a, it's a balance story. It's very cool. So it's not that, well, it is that saturated fats can be inherently damaging simply because there's a deficiency of the omega-3. So you need that full spectrum right. of fats to be able to balance it out. Okay. Right. And, and when the research is being done on saturated fats, they never take the whole picture into account. So they're, they're making conclusions that don't actually address what is really the problem. It's like tunnel, tunnel vision, tunnel vision, narrow focus. And can lead to conclusions that are that are actually not true. Interesting. So, what what types of saturated fats do you recommend people could include if they have sufficient omega three? Okay, I I would I I would I'm going to change the question. When it comes to the world of fats, there are only two things that you have to have. One is called omega six. Linoleic acid is the is the essential fatty acid or omega-3, alpha-linolenic acid, is the essential fatty acid. That's all you need from fats. Everything else your body can make. Your body can make EPA and DHA from alpha-linolenic acid. They cheated on some of the studies. That's a whole other, we could do a whole other story on that one. Um, and, and the idea that alpha-linolenic acid has no function other than to turn into EPA and DHA is not true. It's not even true by the research. It's just true in the marketplace. <laughs> By, by some people who are trying to promote EPA and DHA. So, um, so the body can convert into EPA and DHA, and then the, the EPA is converted into hormones called eicosanoids, and there's dozens of them. And the DHA is converted into antioxidants and anti-inflammatories and immune enhancers and mood enhancers. So there's a lot of things that can be made out of ALA, provided you get enough of them for that to happen. And the issue in our population isn't that we can't convert. The issue is we're not getting enough starting material to do enough conversion. And so why we addressed it the way we addressed it with, with first with flax oil and then with the blend that, that I work with. I want to bring in, I would bring in undamaged omega-6s and I want to bring in the missing omega-3s in the form, in the most stable, most basic form, and then, then let the body that has been doing this for like eons, let the body decide where and when and how much to make according to its, his, its own need and feedback. Right? That's why I never worked with fish oils. That's why I never recommended. They're even more sensitive to damage. That's why they, that's why they burp on you. And that's why they taste so bad. Because, because of damage. Because they're super, super, super sensitive to light oxygen and heat damage. Wow. So if we consume, say, um, more omega-3s and more omega-6s, then our body's going to be able to make the the other fats that we've been typically told we need to get from supplementation or from, from special foods. Okay. So that makes sense yep, to me. Yep. In fact, so then in fact, if I'm going to be set. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, uh, linoleic acid, nobody talks about taking arachidonic acid supplements much. Some people have tried. It's because we all get enough omega sixes and probably in some cases we get too much. What we're missing. So, so yes. you want to so you want to do two things. One is you want to you want to bring in omega sixes that are not damaged because that's really important. Yep. I call that your body needs an oil change. Dirty oils out, clean oils in. So omega sixes you need to switch to clean ones, 
and omega-3s. You need clean ones, obviously, but you need to bring in enough because most people don't get enough. When you do those two things and you keep them in the right ratio, a lot of good stuff happens in your body because they're both required nice. by every cell. They're both equally essential. It's just our status of them is different. One is damaged and the other one's missing. So those two, you address those two yep. topics and you get an oil that's made with health in mind, that is in glass, that is organic, that uh, has the right ratio of omega-3 to 6. We say twice as much omega-3 as omega-6, partly because they're missing, to get that balance right. And uh, that covers everything you actually need to do from oils. There are also omega-9s in the oils, and there's those saturated fats in oils, but you don't need those if you had zero of those. Your body can make those out of sugar and starch, but it cannot make the essential fatty acids wow. and all of the things that are made from them out of sugar and starch. Only you, that's why you have to have the essential fatty acids. And by the way, for the carb lovers, you know, there are no essential carbohydrates. That means that carbohydrates are the least important food other than for energy source, but there are essential fatty acids, there are essential amino acids. And there are essential minerals and essential vitamins. So if the if carbs don't contain anything you can't get el anywhere, then carbs are optional. And that's why a keto diet that pays yeah. attention to getting your omega threes and sixes right, getting both undamaged in the right ratio, is 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 it, for many people a preferable diet to the, the carb rich carb rich diet. Yeah. And then even there's people that like Dr. Will Cole talk about this idea of a sort of keto slash Mediterranean, which is still a focus on vegetables, uh, greens yeah. and plants, but then also good quality fats, good quality uh, protein. So, okay. Um, if somebody is say, for instance, eating good fats, you know, there's a, like you said, there's a tier, you need these fats, then you need these proteins. And then the rest you don't really need, but you just get when you eat yeah. enough calories, right? Yeah. So that's which sort of paints this picture of a ketogenic diet being a diet that focuses on essential fats and essential no. amino acids. No. So if people are- No, 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 okay. no. Most keto diets do not pay attention to essential fatty acids because they need, they need care. Okay. Yeah. They need care. And the keto diet that doesn't pay attention to the essential fatty acids and doesn't get them made with health in mind is not long-term sustainable. Can you can be used for weight Understood. loss? Can be used for weight loss. Sometimes it's just water dumping water, but it, but it's not long-term sustainable for health if you don't make sure that the priority is not just on fat but on the two essential fats. Understood. Perfect. That makes yeah. sense. So. Uh, thank you for the clarification. Um, and so say if somebody is eating in this way, they're focusing on the essential fatty acids that are important, omega-6, omega-3. They're yeah. focusing on essential amino acids, and then they're filling out their diet with you know, good quality vegetables, um, cruciferous vegetables, for instance, uh, yeah. or, you know, et cetera. Then if somebody is also supplementing with your oil, for instance, how else can people from a whole food source be ensuring they're increasing their omega-3 and omega-6 intake? Because this is so important. So if they're taking your oil and they're consuming whole foods, mm -hmm. what foods are on the top of your list when it comes to um, increasing omega-3 intake? Oh, and uh, well, the, the plant-based, the plant-based, the richest source after flax and chia, because those both of those are the, they're about 60% of their, fatty acids are omega-3, but both unbalanced in omega-6. I became omega-6 deficient okay. on flax oil. That was the first oil we developed. And I got dry eyes, skipped heartbeats, arthritis-like pain on finger joints, and thin papery skin when I used it exclusively as my source of fat. And that happened within three, three months. Okay. And so I fixed that by taking okay. sunflower seeds, which have a lot of six, but no three, and got the balance back all the symptoms disappeared. So other than those two, there's a um, psyllium seed, not the husk that we use for laxative, but the seed is used in India. Its yes. oil is 30% omega-3s. 
There's Sacha Inchi. It's similar wow. to that. Um, there's Kukui Nut, which is similar to that again. Kukui Nut is, comes from the Pacific wow. Islands. Uh, and then around our latitudes, the next one is hemp, which is about 19% omega-3 and 57% omega-6. So, so we, uh, And then canola is the next one, 10% omega-3. Walnut, somewhere between 5 and yes. 11% omega-3. And soy being about 5 to 7 or five, uh, 7 to 9% omega-3. So those are pretty much the sources. Grass is 60% omega-3 in its fat, but the total amount of fat in grass is 0.1%. Whereas the seeds and nuts ha- have 25 to 60% fat, and the grains have usually 2 to 4, except for soybean, which is 18% fat. Sure. That makes sense. Perfect. And what about animal, so- animal sources of, of omega-3? And our omega six fish oil, but fish is now the dirtiest meat on the planet, yeah. and fish oils are super damaged. Yeah, uh, and and actually, many of the carnivorous fish get their EPA and DHA made by algae at the bottom of the food chain. Yeah, so you can also get algae oil that has EPA and DHA in it, uh-huh. but often highly processed. So you you got to pay attention to that. And then you know the the krill eats the the algae and then the big, little fish eat the krill and then yeah. the big fish eat the little fish. So EPA and DHA made by algae works its way through the food chain. Uh, it's better to get it low on the food chain because you have the least toxicity on the bottom of the food chain. Got it. And krill is better than fish because it's in a different form that is more effective and you need less and it's lower on the food chain. Got it. And it has its own antioxidant and all of the yeah. all of the environmental issues were addressed before they put the first nest in the water. That was never addressed. The sustainability was never addressed with fish oil. Mm. And the ocean is now our sewer. Yeah. So uh, less and less. I don't eat, you know, I used to eat salmon for omega-3s. I don't eat it anymore. No. Because there's so much plastic in there and yeah. all, you know, PCBs, dioxins, all kinds of stuff. And then more processing and more damage. What about fish lower on the food chain, like herring, herring, herring or anchovies or sardines? Do, do they still fit into your sort of spectrum? No, of, I, I don't eat okay. any of them anymore. I'm 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 out of the ocean, except except for the except for krill. I stop at krill. Yeah, but they are they they're probably a little less toxic than than the salmon are. You know, the higher you go in the food chase chain, the more the toxins yes. accumulate. And the lower on the food chain, the more fast regenerating, which is the more sustainable as well. So so sardines, mackerel, herring are smaller, faster regenerating fish, and they eat less other fish. So they have less toxic accumulation. They live less long. So, okay. And then land-based land based products so i hear about like eggs contain some you know dha or omega-3 etc and and maybe even uh grass-fed beef how do you feel about that well no because uh beef the ungulates the the four stomach animals so sheep cows goats um and and deer and all those animals they have four stomachs and they actually hydrogenate the omega threes and sixes to a large extent. So there's very little omega three and six in the body. They do have some in their brain, their eyeballs, and their sperm. Uh, so, uh, in in terms of um, horses, are omega three animals. Not most people don't eat horses, but there, there are people who do. So horses are omega three animals. Zebras are omega three animals, and they get that from grass. You have to eat a lot of grass to get a lot of omega threes but they don't convert them in their body into something that is no longer omega-3. And what else? There are certain, certain birds, um, but I don't use animals really as a sort of omega of, of omegas. They mostly have converted omegas, not omega-3 uh, and 6 essential fatty acids, but essential fatty acid derivatives that your body can make if you optimize your intake of the essential fatty acids themselves. Got it. So you would use animal products sparingly and more as as an essential amino acid source as opposed to an omega-3 source, which would be coming more from plants. And there would be an occasional stock or stew, not fried form of animal product, which would facilitate more of the amino acid story. Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, although although the uh, certainly I would use animal protein or our animals for protein source, although even the idea that you have to have animals to get your proteins that's been debunked for yeah. probably ten or fifteen Absolutely. or twenty years. You know, you can yeah. get enough. You know, unless you're a bodybuilder on steroids, you can get enough protein on a plant based diet. Seeds and nuts are very high in protein, and uh, beans have have a certain amount along with more carbs. And grains have some along with more carbs. And even even grass, you know, a steak is made out of grass. You know, when a cow eats grass, it makes a steak. There's enough protein in the grass to make the steak that you want to eat. So fundamentally, highly concentrated. your steak is made out of grass. Yeah. yeah. And the, yeah, highly concentrated. Yeah. It's a, it's a, yeah, it's a more, more concentrated form of grass. Same with the milk, the protein in milk that we say we need. Well, that came out of grass too. Right, so milk is made out of grass. So why not just eat the grass? <laughs> right, and it's a lower on the food chain again, and you know it's a lot, lot easier for the planet. So I am a big proponent of heading in the direction, you know, fresh, whole, raw, organic, mostly plant-based for humans. Nice. Heading in that direction. Fantastic. Yeah. Okay, and take your fry pan, hit yourself over the head with it. Use a stock or a crock pot. Uh, get more safe sunlight exposure, making sure that you have good quality fats in your diet and, uh, don't wear sunglasses, um, be in nature. Um, you know, yeah. there's a lot of profound Start a advice nude beach, here. Run around naked, get your vitamin Start D. Start a nude beach. <laughs> yeah. Sun your, sun your genitals as mm -hmm. well. Uh, and, and, um, if you're going to cook with any oils, make sure they're as stable as possible and have a high yeah. smoke point right. if you if you at all do that no 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 smoke point smoke point is garbage you know if you smoke oh, really? point okay. is yes the smoke point is the point where an oil turns into smoke yes now clearly you've changed the chemistry if you turn oil into smoke 100 and smoke does yeah. not have any essential nutrients in it okay but long before it turns into smoke you're already doing all kinds of damage to the oils like what well, you get oxidized molecules, you get fragmented molecules, you get double bond shifted molecules, you get cross-linked molecules within as well as across triglycerides, you get cyclized molecules, you get dimerized molecules, trans fatty acids, polymerized molecules, trimerized. So there's a whole lot of different kinds of damage that's done to oils long before they turn into smoke. And those are, again, all things, we don't even measure them. We talk about rancidity in oils, but we're not measuring yes. trans fats. We know less than 1%. Yes. Uh, but some of these other ones that I mentioned, they're not even measured. You can measure them in a laboratory, but they're not measured in, in the marketplace. And so you don't even know how much stuff you've got in there. Wow. Which is why I am a proponent of, of putting all of those kinds of oils aside and going to either the seeds and nuts that contain the oils and then balancing it through picking how much of each of those seeds and nuts you eat or using oils made with health in mind to get the omega-3 and 6 you need. Okay. That's so I why. have a practical question then, U U Udo. Then. Uh -huh. So if you're making a stock or a stew or a broth, you're yeah. – basically limit limiting the temperature exchange happening in that to about 100 degrees celsius which is the boiling point of water right? yes Just when you like cook you in said, water when yeah that's yeah, when the you cook in water you, because... you <laughs> when you cook in water you you can't heat it higher than 100 degrees celsius or 200 degrees fahrenheit so then you can take that off the heat and then you can add oil to it before you eat, you know, salt, pepper, and oil, right? Yeah. That, and, and you can and you put the, you can mix the oil into any food you eat. It goes with uh, fruit, with vegetables, with starches, and with proteins. With the starches, you might get put on some weight, but it's the starches that do that, not the oils. So that's the least good idea of, of the food compatibilities. You can put it in shakes and smoothies. And you can put it in hot pasta sauce and on steamed vegetables. That heat will not damage it, but you do it when it's on your plate before you eat it. 
Okay. Because the temperature is not too high. The, the temperature that damages oils in the absence of light and heat is 160 degrees Celsius, about 320 degrees Fahrenheit. In the presence of oil, when you increase the temp, uh, in, the, it's a, in the presence of uh, heat, uh, light and oxygen, every 10 degrees Celsius that you go up in temperature, you double, triple, or quadruple the rate of chemical reactions that take place. So you want to above 100 so you, degrees Celsius or any any 10 degrees. No, 10 degrees Celsius. Yeah, yeah well. that's why that's why you put the oil on your food if you're eating hot food. You put it on the hot hot food and then you eat it. You don't let it sit yeah. around on hot food, and you don't put the oil in the cooking. You put the oil on after. Okay, and those oils could be things you, like ghee or butter or olive oil or yeah yeah but ghee ghee and butter ghee actually i is is being uh pointed Heated. to as the re reason why there's so much cardiovascular disease in india the same amount as we get here but they get one eighth the cancer and the ghee is oxidized cholesterol so there's a problem with that and they have it sit around for a long time and the longer it sits the more it oxidizes and the more it oxidizes the more you get oxidized LDL and the more concerns there are with it. I'm talking about putting the essential fatty acids on the food. Yeah, on the food. You know, Udo's yeah. oil is the, is the, is the, you know, is the, is basically the, the flagship of it, right? Omega-3 and 6 in the right ratio, make health in mind, never used for frying. Of course. Okay. Yeah. What about, where do you stand on butter then? Because to me, that's always been absolutely the worst food in the world. And then there's communities that say it's a great quality food. The lactase and the lactose has sort of been taken out if it's a grass fed or a cultured butter. Um, and you're from also European stock heritage as well. Yeah. I mean, butter and potatoes saved the world, you know, in a way during the, the hunger winter. So where do you sit on, on, the, on the butter story? And, and with your last name, you know about the Irish famine? Of course. Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So... So I had to change my mind about ghee and butter. I thought, you know, the reason why ghee is made is because they didn't have refrigeration. It's a hot climate. So they took the butter and they heated it so that oh. light stuff got skimmed off the top and the heavy stuff got left at the bottom. And now they had a pure fat product that had a pretty good shelf life. That's why they did that. Mm. Butter, on the other hand, has a whole bunch of cell debris in it. I've had to change my mind. Actually, the butter is preferable because it has the cell debris in it. Because if it's fresh, there is not as the the cholesterol isn't oxidized. But that's an issue with butter as well. That's also an issue with meat, and that's also an issue with certain cheeses that you can get uh, uh, oxidized cholesterol in it. So I don't use I use either very much. But if the butter is fresh and you made it at home, we used to churn it, churn the cream, it would go sour. So it also had some probiotics in it. And so we Cultured used to, butter. so we used to, you, we used to use that when I was a kid. And, you know, we also worked really hard. We cleared 40 acres of bushland by hand and by horse. So we worked very hard. So if you work really hard, you burn some trans fatty acids and you burn some of the things that aren't that good for you. Um, I I don't I don't clear I don't clear forty acres by hand and by horse these days, so I pay more attention. I I don't use butter. I just use the oil. Wherever you use butter, you can you can pour oil in your bread, right? You yeah. got But then of course it'll 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 drip through. So you got to pay attention to that. But uh, <laughs> but yeah, because I want because I know I need the essential fatty acids. I know I want them undamaged. They need to be clean. They need to be in the right ratio. They need to be packaged in glass because plastic yes. swells and plastic ingredients uh, leach into oils because the chemistry of plastic and oils is quite similar. So I, I fundamentally just focus on what is the good stuff. So what I do with it, with, with I, I mix it in everything, but the, my main thing is I get tahini, organic tahini. Yes. And the, you know when that tahini sits, the tahini, the, the sesame oil is on top. It has only omega threes, yes. no omega sixes. So I dump that out, then I put my oil on it, 
because it's a better oil. And then I have a, a tahini with omega-3s and omega-6s. And then I put in all kinds of spices like uh, black seed and, and clove and turmeric and, or, or mm. curry and ashwagandha and uh, cayenne. And uh, what else do I do? Cinnamon, you know, uh, so, some of the great spices. So I use the spices in my, in my uh, udo's oil tahini. And then I yeah. eat that with my, I eat tons of green vegetables because they f- produce good spark yes. control for the fire of life. The oil builds the fire. A good fire throws sparks. You want the spark control, the antioxidants in green vegetables and plant-based low starch plants are my spark control. Amazing. I love it. So you just heard it there. Udo's tahini spread. Yeah. Uh, ta- uh, yeah. tahini with the Udo's oil with all these incredible spices. Um, it sounds incredible. And to have that on your green vegetables, what a gift. Udo, I just want to say thank you so much for your time and for the work that you've, you've gifted to the world. You know, the book was really transformative for me. And uh, so if you want to talk about the, uh, the mental, the mind stuff, the, uh, uh, and the other, the other, what health is about in terms of nature and human nature. I'll do another interview with you. If you're great. Yeah, let's come back to this again. That would be great. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I think your philosophical approach to life has been built upon a lot of unique human experience from obviously World Absolutely. War II to psychedelics to both you know, external and internal. Side to that research. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Uh, but what you've sh- what you've shared today has been truly remarkable, and I just want to uh, reiterate again that your book had such a profound effect on me uh, and Laurentine and 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 our work, and uh, and I thank you so much for your contribution to the to the world through this. And and thank and thank you for the work that you do to getting to getting information out. That's so important. You're welcome. It's not that's number one to health, right? It's education. Yes, first step. So important. First so step. Important. Because if you don't know, then you can't. Then you can't do it. Then you can't get it. Then you can't change. It's true. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you, Udo. Thank you so much. Have a beautiful day, and I uh, look forward to connecting yeah. again sometime in the future. Thank you, James. For everything that we've mentioned in today's episode, you can check out the show notes. There will be links and information there for you. And before I go, I just wanted to say thank you so much for taking the time to invest in yourself and be here for this podcast. If there's anybody that you can think of who could benefit from this information, please make sure to share it with them. We believe in the power of life-changing information, and it's especially powerful when it's shared from a trusted source. And finally, if you could leave us a comment or make sure to subscribe to the podcast, we would greatly appreciate that. It helps us continue to bring you this life-changing information and make sure that you get all future podcast updates sent to you. Have a beautiful day and thank you once again.